we were blessed in the first service to have our school superintendent, our superintendent of schools here, and um, he shared with us in a very intimate way, explaining how he um, opens the Word of God each morning, and uh, one of the books that he's currently in that he's using is a devotional, and it was just really a blessing to hear that our new superintendent is a very deeply mature Christian and that uh, he's pursuing God and uh, learning the Word of God. And uh, I hope that that speaks to us all a blessing on this community. And so we have invited those who are educators, those who are um, working in the cafeteria, those who um, are custodians, anyone who's like a bus driver, a mechanic, anyone who's part of what it takes to make the school year happen. Um, we've invited them to come. We've invited the teachers from our own uh, four-star um, learning center here because they're preparing uh, students uh, to become students. And uh, we've invited all of you here today. We've asked the blessing on our kids, but now we would ask if you're here as an educator this morning, an administrator, um, a principal, what have you, if you just stand at this time, let's stretch out our arms to those who stand and let's ask God's blessing upon them. All righty. Very good. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for teachers and coaches and uh, administrators and curriculum specialists. Lord, we thank you for those who are involved with um, transporting our students. Lord, we thank you for those who, who cook food for our students and all the different things that, uh, all the different roles that have to be worked out so that our kids can be educated. Lord, we give thanks and praise for these people. Lord, um, we ask a few things for them this morning, that as they begin this school year, that they begin with a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that they would be infused with joy and that it would be um, something that would be so uh, coming out of them that it would in be infused into our kids as they return to school. Lord, that their, their joy would be contagious. And Father, we ask that as the, the days and weeks uh, hasten through, and Lord, maybe at that moment of weariness comes, that Lord, that your joy would be their strength. And Lord, that in their weakness, that your strength would be made perfect. Father, we are asking your blessing upon these who educate our kids. Lord, use them in such a way that um, our kids experience you through them. Extend your blessing to them in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And if you prayed that with me, would you say amen? amen. And would you encourage those who have stood this morning? <laughs> Hear these words from Philippians chapter 3. Not that I've already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. <laughs> Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we've already attained, what we've already learned. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Now, as I considered what the Lord might have me say to you on this Back to School Blessing Sunday, I felt the need to make sure all of you know this perhaps little known fact. Were you aware that when a giraffe is born, that little newborn comes out of the mother who remains standing, and therefore the newborn calf falls 10 feet and lands splat on its back? Um, welcome to this world. <laughs> what a welcome! Right? Within seconds, it rolls to an upright position and instinctively tries to gather its legs underneath and, and get up on those wobbly pins of theirs. Yeah, and the mother giraffe lowers her head long enough to take, make a quick inspection. You know, I imagine she's counting, okay, four hooves, that's good. You know, wants to check out her baby, and then school begins. 
You see, the mother giraffe, uh, after she checks the baby, seems to do quite an unreasonable thing. She kicks her baby and sends it sprawling, head over heels. And if that baby doesn't get up immediately, she kicks it again and again until that little one finally gets up on its spindly legs. And yet, the mama giraffe's not done. It's amazing. She wants her baby to remember how it gets up, how to get up quickly. So guess what she does? She kicks it again, sends it sprawling head over heels, and then immediately goes over to make sure that baby gets up quickly. And she repeats the lesson over and over until the mother is assured that that young giraffe, that young calf, knows how to get up quickly and get on its feet. Because in the wild, baby giraffes must be able to get up quickly in order to stay with the herd and avoid uh, maybe becoming uh, some predator's meal. And the best way a mother giraffe has of, of protecting her calf's life is to get that baby up quickly and get moving. Now, how many of you like that teaching style? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but you know what? How many of us can think back to someone who gave us a swift kick or kind of gave us a push in life and at the time we didn't really like it too much but now when we reflect on it, boy, are we thankful they loved us enough to give us that swift kick or to give us that push. Anyone here thinking of somebody right now? Yeah, we give thanks to God. And here's my point. God's desire is to protect you. And he does so by teaching you. You remember what he said when we were talking about this last week, how God says he doesn't want his people to be undone due to a lack of knowledge, right? Right? He wants us to learn. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 says, The Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Now, as each of you are a student of life, and a lifelong student, and we move towards, you know, whatever the next chapter is in our lives, we got to keep this in mind. God will use many people to give us a swift kick, who, to give us a push when we need it, so that we can learn what we need to learn and then, in turn, teach someone else. You know, if we love the Lord, love one another, and make disciples, you know, we've got to be disciples ourselves first. You know, we can't lead people to a place we've never been. So, you know, if we're going to lead people to be disciples, and that means we have to be disciples first, and as we get to the, a certain level in our discipleship of knowing about God, our job is then to share it with somebody else. That's what it's always been about. So we've got to keep, just keep that in mind. And I remember how much I changed um, as I prepared to end my high school career and move on to bigger and better things. In fact, it was June 7th of uh, 31 years ago that um, the graduation ceremony for the class of 1984 took place for Tuslaw High School. And um, I, along with 276 other students, um, prepared to walk into the uh, high school uh, stadium there for our graduation ceremony. And I was privileged to be one of four who got to speak to the class, uh, one of the four speakers uh, for our graduation. Now, you want to know something? It must not have been a very memorable speech because I can't remember one thing that I said to the student body. However, there was a fellow there who stood up to speak. He was our class president. And... Um, he started having a pretty good time up there. In fact, he kind of crossed a line in my mind. He started roasting the teachers and making fun of people and uh, making a general fool of himself. I don't remember a lot of what he said. I just remember how uncomfortable I was. And I looked around and it was like everyone was like awkward because it just didn't feel good. But somehow in the sea of words that he said that day, there is one phrase that I remember. It was when he waved his diploma in the air and he said, it's time to stop learning and start living. And you know what? My classmates cheered for him. I was probably amongst the rabble that cheered. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Really? Stop learning? Start living? I couldn't disagree with that statement today um, more than I do. Wrong. 
And I think that sometimes, you know, we get that feeling, you know, when we get to a certain thing where we feel like we're going on to the next step or we're graduating, you know, but uh, I can imagine after a student works hard for 12 years and, you know, finishes up high school, they might feel that way for a moment. Or after doing four years and getting your bachelor's degree or doing your three or four year master's level, you know, whatever you go to, whatever level of formal education you go to, there is always going to be that tendency for a moment to say, I can stop learning now. But oh my, don't let that moment linger. Don't let it last. Huh. Time to stop learning, start living. How can we live if we're not learning? We're called in the Christian life to be lifelong learners. In fact, we're called disciples, are we not? And that word itself means learners, people who follow to learn. That's how Jesus referred to his, his followers, as disciples, learners. And you know, it's one of the basics of spiritual growth. It's a never-ending process of learning and then, please, for our Lord's sake, sharing it with someone else that they too might learn. That's why we say our whole purpose for being around is to love God more, to learn more about him, and to love one another, to learn more about each other, and in turn, learning more about God through each other. And then, as we take all of what we've learned and we apply it in our lives to make disciples for Jesus Christ, to transform this planet, that's what we're about. Now, scientists say that humans only utilize 10% of their brain. Did you know that? You're working on 10% of uh, what God gave you. I've been thinking about, a lot about that. I, I think there's a reason that we've got 90% left. I think it's because we will go through all eternity learning all the things that God has prepared for us who love him. And we're going to need the other 90% so we can retain. Amen? How many of you remember what you had for breakfast this morning? I mean, we tend to forget, oh, okay, well, praise the Lord. Some of you are sharper than I, all right? But I, we tend to forget things. I, I, one of my dad's favorite things to say is, that guy knows more, has forgotten more than I'll ever know. It took me a while to figure out what he meant by that, but he was trying to pay a compliment that that man knew so much that he had forgotten things, and my dad was still learning from him. And I, I think that the reason we've got that 90% left is because Scripture is pretty clear that our eyes have not seen, our ears have not heard all that God has prepared for those who love him. But then it goes on to say, but it shall be revealed to those who will hear, to those who will listen, to those who will learn by the Spirit, says the Lord. That's Scripture. And when it, we, we think about that 10%, 90%, it all makes sense when you look at the Scripture that says, you know, right now we see through a glass darkly but then we will see face to face. There will be that day when the other 90% is gonna come in real handy, amen? That is something we've got to look forward to because God ha has his people as disciples, as learners, and I don't think it ends when we graduate from planet Earth. I think that's just the beginning of the next 90%. We're gonna always be learning. God designed us that way. Now consider the Apostle Paul. He was without a doubt one of the most influential Christian leaders of the first century. Wrote more than half the New Testament, started several churches. He was a church planner. He helped spread Christianity throughout the entire known world. And he was given the title of apostle, all right? The highest title of authority in the early church. And he used his authority to settle matters of doctrine, teaching, he, to help establish church policy, I don't know if he ever made it to establishing committees or not, but in spite of all of his influence, in spite of all of his power, Paul never reached a point where he said, you know, I've arrived. I'm there. I've got 100% of my brain functioning. I've learned everything I can learn. In fact, what did we hear in this morning's scripture? Right off the end of Paul's pen, he says, it's not that I have obtained all this. It's not that I know it all. It's not that I've already been made perfect, but... I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. He's saying, I'm going to continue to be a learner. I'm still a student. I'm going to be one all my life. That's what he's saying. That's what following Christ is all about, being a lifelong student. So very quickly, I just want to go through three things that we need to know if we're going to be a student. And first of all, this. Every student has a teacher. 
Every student has a teacher. As I said, Paul was one of the most influential Christians in the first century, and yet he submitted to the authority and went under the teaching of other disciples, of other learners. He needed to be taught as much as he was a teacher himself. In Galatians 2, Paul tells how at the beginning of his ministry, he went to the other church leaders. He went to the other apostles, and he asked for their approval. He said, I'm going to teach. I want you to hear this, and then I want you to tell me, am I in line? Is this what God has for me? He needed to be taught. He needed to be coached. Every student has a teacher. John Elway was one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game of football, and yet, you want to know something? He had a coach. He had people who throughout his entire professional life were still teaching him how to improve his game, how to get better. In the final, uh, I, I think about uh, Michael, Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players of all time. But you know what? I've looked at his career. He always had a coach. He always had other people who were continuing to work with him to improve his game, to teach him more. I've been fortunate to have some really good teachers over the years. I'm fortunate now to have many of you as teachers in my life. Thank you for investing in my life. Um, but I want you to think right now about somebody who has taught you over the years. Maybe it was that person who gave you a push or a swift kick, but maybe it was just someone who came alongside of you. I remember a teacher named Mrs. Finley in my high school that came up, and at the time, I was a bit offended by what she told me. She goes, Scott, you can't do everything with excellence. You can do a few things with excellence, so stop trying to do everything. You know, I'm still working on that. Thank you, sweetheart. She got the loudest amen award. But you want to know, I, see, I keep coming back to that because it was good, solid counsel. You can only do a few things with excellence. So if you want your life to be one that rings with excellence, pick a few things and do them with excellence and don't try to do everything because you know what? The best you're going to come up with is you might get a lot of things done well or good but not with excellence. You gotta concentrate. That's why we only have three or four things that we concentrate as on, a ch on as a church so that we can do them with excellence, right? Because we can't do it all. Thank God that there are other fellowships of believers in this town who are doing the other things that God needs done in Conneaut, amen? Yeah, and so we've got to find what God has for us and do it with excellence because we don't want to learn the teaching and then not apply it in our life. I loved what uh, Debbie said to the kids. Wisdom is when you take the head knowledge and apply it to your life. We can know certain things, but if we don't uh, employ that, 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 that learning to our life, all is lost. So if you want to be successful in, area, in any area of life, as a student, you got to have a teacher, right? So, every student has a teacher. Secondly, every student has a subject. Paul, I could say, maybe had a, his curriculum, his subject, out for all of us to see in the passage that I read this morning. Verse 11, he said, this is what I want. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering so that I may become like him. That's what he was after. That was his subject. Is that yours this morning? You know, one of the most important lessons we can learn in life, the most important subject that we can study is that pursuit of, of God's heart, of discovering the essence of who he is and then trying to become more like him so that when other people see us, they might see just some reflection of who Jesus is by the way we walk, by the way we talk, by the way we interact with others. And you know, if your life isn't aligned spiritually, everything else falls apart. And I'm, I spoke about this in the first service this morning, but we gotta remember the very simple illustration that life is like a chair. Now, I was kind of checking you out this morning. As you came into your seat, you were talking and walking, and most of you just plopped right down. None of you picked up the chair and examined it to make sure that the legs were all sturdy. You trusted that that chair was good. And I'll tell you what, people are going to lean on you in life, and they're going to trust that you're good. And you've got the, a, a, a mental side, an intellectual side, that if you don't work out, 
You know, if you stop reading, if you stop interacting with things cerebrally, you, you get lazy in that area. You get weak, all right? You also have that emotional side, right, where you're interacting with others, learning um, how to interact with other folks so that you can be a blessing to them, right? But if you just hole up in a cave by yourself, you know, you get to where you're half as scared to talk or to hold a conversation with someone. And um, we all have a physical side, you know, that we either take care of or we don't, right? And if we get weak physically, people can't lean on us. But let's not forget the most important leg. A, le a chair with three legs, it doesn't stay up very well. And we, all of us are spiritual beings. All of us. It's just a matter of whether we're working that out or not. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir. You all showed up at church this morning. You're busy working it out. You're interacting with one another, working yourself out on the emotional end and the intellectual end and the physical end, you know, and the spiritual end. And I'm telling you what, when times get tough and people come to lean on others, they find out very quickly whose spiritual leg on their chair is weak. Or non-existence. I think about all the people we know about who have achieved fame and wealth and what this world calls success, and yet their, their lives are, are shambles. Do you remember Phil Hartman and his wife? Unbelievable. Um, seemed to have everything going for him. He was funny. He was successful. Had a beautiful family, yet there was such an emptiness in his life and in his marriage that couldn't be filled by his success or by her drug abuse as a result of that, that terrible void. And as a, res as a result, their lives ended in horrible tragedy. His wife shot him, and then she shot herself back in 1998. It was horrible. Who would have thunk? Where did they stop learning? Where did they stop growing? Which of the legs on their chair was weak? Think about John Candy, incredibly funny guy, yet he couldn't stop eating because his personal life was so emotionally empty. In his own words, my life is so emotionally empty that all I can do to ease the pain is to stuff myself with food, end quote, months before he died. Chris Farley, another brilliant comedian, yet his personal life out of control, and I could go on and on. Kurt Cobain, River Phoenix, all these people who have achieved, uh, achieved wealth and fame and fortune. John Belushi, and yet, all appeared, though they had the world going for them, and yet, something was missing. A leg on the chair wasn't being worked out and had grown weak or wasn't there at all. They stopped learning. And folks, having that relationship with God is the beginning of that successful life where the wealth and the fame and the fortune that might be entrusted to you by God then has purpose. And you can spiritually stand it. Having that relationship, according to Paul, is the end all and be all. Listen to this, verses 7 to 8. 7 to 8. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. For the sake of Christ, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing God. I consider everything else rubbish that I might gain Christ. There's a guy who's got his um, priorities in order. He's checking the legs on his chair. We've got to keep this in mind. Being a Christian means being one who follows Christ, learning the whole way learning the whole while. Now, when I was in high school and even somewhat in college, I remember that there was um, chances where you could take courses called electives. They were like um, alternative classes, and I, I wrote down a few of them uh, for this morning. One such class was called The World of Sports, and um, I checked out the uh, what, what you had to do to pass the class. There was no diagramming sentences or anything like that. It, all you had to do was read Sports Illustrated for that semester, and then you had to write a paper on some element of athletic competition, and you'd probably cruise through with an easy A. I remember um, suggesting to my parents that I take that course. Here's another one. Um, 
driver's ed was another elective you could take as long as you didn't crash the school car, you passed, right? Um, there was another one called bachelor living, and I, I could go on and on and describe these, but I wish that I could say I didn't take these class because I knew they wouldn't help ultimately and that I needed to stay you know, more in line with the, the regular curriculum, but I can't say that. My parents basically said, um, nay, nay, you will not be taking those classes, and um, they kept me enrolled in classes that they knew would help me. I remember they made me take home ec. Does anybody remember that? You could not be a cool guy in school and take home ec in the 80s, okay? I had to take it because mom wanted me to know how to sew. I know how to sew. I know how to iron. I know how to do a lot of those things, and do you know what? I give thanks to my mom now, but I can tell you, she tested my very fiber having to walk into that class as a male student. And then I found out that when you're the only guy and everyone else is a girl, it's not too bad a deal. So, <laughs> all right. Here's my point. Sometimes in life we have a tendency to study the wrong subjects, to spend our time learning in the wrong arenas. Do you ever fight that one? You know, we take life's equivalent of world of sports or bachelor living, and we start missing the more important things that God has for us. You know, the most important subject's knowing Christ. And out of that will flow all the other subjects that he will lead you to that you need to meet those people he's already got planned to be put into your path that he might teach you through them. And expect this. You're going to be one of those teachers for someone else. He's going to place you in someone else's path. So we've got to be faithful to this whole idea of being a lifelong learner. Here's the last thing, and let me just close quickly. Every student has a teacher. Every student has a subject, and every student has an objective. You know, when you go to school, it's more than to learn just to learn. You go to learn certain things so that you can fare well in a certain career or obtain some specific objective. And as a disciple of Christ, what's your objective? Are you trying to learn what you need to know so that you can lead someone else to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? So that we can take Connie out for Christ, so that we can really live in to our calling to love the Lord, love one another, and make disciples. Yeah. It's the greatest gift a person can have, a, a sense of mission, a sense of purpose, a, an objective. As lifelong learners, we've got to have an objective. We've got to be able to live into that calling that God has for us. So I wonder if you'd take a moment and just pray with me because we're going to need God's help to do this. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we want to be lifelong students. We understand that we should never stop learning, that as disciples... We follow you that we might learn more about you. We never stop growing. We never stop becoming. Lord, we give thanks today for the teachers that you've placed in our paths. Lord, the learnings, the lessons that you've given us along the way that have taken shape and into a calling on our lives. Lord, we would just ask that you lead and guide and direct us, give us discernment and wisdom so that everything we do can be something that is accomplished for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, I ask our ushers.